Spend some time away from your office bed to the good cafe. Open data, go open data, open data, go open data. We meet up virtually, our beverages are free for open data coffee. Welcome to the Good Cafe. Indeed, welcome to the Good Cafe. On today's menu, we have a somewhat confusing brew, an odd flavored open data, where you at? But we think you might like that. Hello, everyone. I'm Keith McDonald, your barista for the Good Cafe and also the director of communications for Go Open Data. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you on a beautiful day out here. We've got some uh, real exciting uh, guests that I want to introduce to you in just a second. First up, I just want to talk a little bit of housekeeping for you. We are recording the session today to um, be put up on our GoodTube YouTube channel, which we've just started so people can uh, take a look at it again, or if they weren't able to attend today, they can see it. So that means that we're recording things. And that's appropriate to you if you join in on what we call the second cup feature, which is going to be about um, 20 minutes from now. Um, and that's where you get a chance to talk to our panelists. So if you want to be anonymous, you can always use the chat or QA piece for that. Okie doke. So let's get back to who our guests are and we can get started for our little coffee break today. Uh, we've got three really great people. Um, that would be Jackie Liu, Derek Alton, and Denise Carr. And I'm going to introduce them to you now. Uh, let's start with Jackie. If you want to flick on your camera there. There she is. How you doing? Good to see you. I, I want to actually to read my cheat sheet a little bit on this one too, because uh, I like the way you worded this. Uh, in particular, right off the top, you say that Jackie helps organizations build new nervous systems that use tech and data. I really like that. Um, so currently you're with, you're with Mozilla. Prior to that, you were with Sidewalk Labs and actually back a little ways, you were in New York City in the parks department there. And you were beginning right. things in uh, the open data arena for them. You were head oh. of the data science team and the open data program as well, which I think is really significant. And you do have a, a project on the go as well that's uh, dealing with um, uh, uh, you're building a coalition to implement and improve DTPR, which is an open source communication standard for digital technology, which I think is also fantastic. And DTPR stands for? Um, it started out standing for digital transparency in the public right. realm, but I think that's like the kind of like CC by 4.0, the original kind of <laughs> uh, contributor kind of title. But I think since we started working on it, we are just like, actually, this is way more about transparency. This is way more about just the public realm. This is also about just like having a kind of shared common language and how we talk about data and technology is really about building trust. And so now I get to kind of just lean into and say, we're talking about trust in technology and what does that look like? So we've shifted it to mean digital trust for places and routines, which is just like this fun move <laughs> for us. <laughs> that sounds think great. About that it actually worked. Yeah, <laughs> no, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds great. And of course, we always talk about how open data can lead to more trust and so on. So we may get into that a bit. Uh, next up is Derek Alton, who will uh, have his camera come uh, on for us. There he is. Hello, Derek. And Derek comes to us today from the UK. And I'm trying to avoid going into a British accent because I like to do that. I wish I had an accent. I, I've been here for six months and I still can't do a British accent. I just get made fun of. Is that right? Well, I've been told I've got a pretty good Canadian accent, which is, I guess, you know. Yeah, we, <laughs> apparently we have one, right? I remember in the States one time I was in a shopping mall talking to somebody and he said, there, you said it, you said it. And I said, what? And he went, a boot. So there you go. Uh, so, Derek, uh, a reminder to say hi to the Queen if you see her for us, too, because that would be nice. Uh, well, I, I'm catching up with her in a couple hours, so I'll, Excellent. I'll make sure I, I, I mention that you say hi. She'll Excellent. That. Well, we're looking for volunteers and so on, so if she's interested, or anyone on her staff, we'll take them. So you're out there uh, with a fellowship at the New Speak House, and uh, that sounds like an interesting project, but your, your main job is still with the Government of Canada, is that right, or are you on a sabbatical? Uh, no, I, I'm. I'm. Uh, my day job is uh, working with uh, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. Uh, we're doing some fun stuff on verifiable credentials and really sort of building the digital trust infrastructure for the future of Canada. So super <laughs> interesting, very nerdy. 
uh, that's my day job. And then in the evenings, weekends, when I have spare time, I, yeah, I'm doing a, a research fellowship with the New Speak House, looking at government as a platform, democracy as a platform, really the intersection of tech and society and government. So again, pretty and heady stuff. I guess the other thing I should make sure I do a shout out. I'm also, you know, in my other spare, spare time, uh, working as a president of the Canadian Open Data Society. So, you know, it's a quiet life here in the UK. No kidding. Well, we wanted to have you on actually because of that diversity of experience. And in terms of Canada and the open data push, you're you're really doing a lot to try to get herding cats, I guess is the way I describe it. And it's not easy, right? No, it's it's I mean herding cats puts it lightly. Uh, it's, uh... <laughs> Hurting cats, hurting, yeah, I don't know. There's got to be a better analogy, but it's very <laughs> okay. much hurting cats. We'll work on it. Uh, and finally, we've got uh, Denis Carr. If Denis wants to come on, there he is. And Denis is the supervisor of the Open Data uh, team in the city of Toronto. And I like to call Denis my brother from another mother um, because you uh, took over from me in the city of Toronto when I left. And I took over from Trish Garner when she left. And the reason I bring all three of us up is that we were actually all involved at the very beginning of open data at its launch standpoint. Denis and, and myself were working with Trish on the same uh, area. And uh, you know how we always talk about off the desk work, right? That's kind of how it evolved out there. And it's really gone quite a long way, Denis, for sure, in terms of what uh, you've been able to do with the city and improvements to the website in particular, I think are just awesome. And uh, you were also with uh, 311, and uh, I guess your title around that time was a user experience architect, right? And uh, you yeah. did all kinds of different dabbling around, especially, and I can, I can remember uh, in the early days of 311 in particular, the discussions we had around things like Twitter and so on. So it's uh, it's been an interesting and long road for Denis. He's also got a, a, a huge background outside of things. I, I know if you ever have a speeding ticket, I don't know if you remember this, Denis, but you had the best advice to give ever. Yeah. Don't argue with the cop. <laughs> Right? I was so, in a pirate costume, so maybe a, like it did call for a different uh, approach. Excellent. <laughs> but yeah, honesty, sure. Excellent. <laughs> but yeah, 2009. Wow, long way we've come since then. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So welcome, uh, folks. And uh, what I want to start things off with in our discussion, and I did uh, give you a heads up on that, was this idea of uh, rating the uh, state of open data. One being horrible. 10 being fantastic. So I'd like all three of you to weigh in on this and, and give a ranking and just clarify if you're talking like the world or, or more locally, provincially, just so we have some sense of, of what you're talking about. Uh, why don't we start off with Jackie to give us a ranking there. Okay, so I'm just going to say I'm going to talk about kind of open data in a general sense. I've been kind of disconnected from an open data, running an open data program for a little while. Um, so I would give it like a six, um, which is like not awesome, um, but not terrible either. And so, and I give that it that rating because I think open data is like doing fine from a technical perspective. Like we figured out how to start publishing data, how to kind of work through um, internal mechanisms to actually kind of make data available. But I don't think it's really kind of reached the kind of like culture change impact that was really kind of hoped for in, in, in the movement, at least back in the early days. I think it's, it's definitely useful. It serves a ton of internal government purposes, <laughs> but I think if you think it's like the gateway for civic and private solutions, I think it takes, um, or civic slash private like partnership solutions, it takes way more than just a release data set to actually make it happen. And I think there's kind of two issues. One, in my experience in New York City, the barrier was civics. Like people couldn't wrangle with the data because they didn't actually understand how their government worked. Um, so, um, or, or, and then administrative data is also just like really nasty and ugly. Like there's a lot of like arcane government process that's kind of like baked into how that data set is created. And I don't think um, the translation work to merely make that visible is, it's not easy. Like I used to have to, literally like send people out and be like go watch this data set be generated so that you can understand how to leverage it and i don't know how you you know scale that um and i'd say the kind of like last kind of structural barrier is that you know open data the data is released but i think as people try to use it you start to surface kind of data quality issues and interoperability issues and there isn't that feedback loop to kind of like connect the use of the data back to kind of like the operational systems and the actually like the straight up processes that 
create the data in the first place. So I think until we are able to actually kind of start to think about how we improve that feedback loop, we're going to be kind of stuck in this middle space. Okay, so, so six out of 10 from Jackie. Uh, let's try Denis. Yeah, this is an interesting question. It's a tough one to wrangle with because you have, you think about it in different time frames. You know, it's like where we were, what the expectation was, and the hope for open data. Like, is it in a hype cycle kind of loop, and where are you at there? Versus also to be like, well, you know, there are some surprises around what has happened in the last like few years, and that really helps push a number forward. So I'm going to go with seven and kind of give some context a little bit, like Jackie was saying. It's like, yeah, initially, like first getting involved like in the initial generations of the program it was like this kind of like utopian vision of like it is capable to release all of the information from you know every city system and publish it online and that can be done in a sustainable process and it's like well the hard reality of that is it's quite challenging it's also difficult to prioritize and understand what's going to have the greatest impact and like how to then not only once it's released but activate data in the wild um, I mean, Jackie's point about the civics piece is probably one of those bigger lessons learned um, as we, you know, like take a look at where open data is right now, because it's, it's it's twofold. One, I would think there's, there's kind of two surprises. It's twofold and there's two surprises. Well, the two surprises, I think, for me, that like get a number to about seven is um, one is the advancements towards shared infrastructure between regions between you know interjurisdictional and international that advanced faster than i thought it would um so that really pulls up the number like so to say that like city of toronto provincial government and the federal government as well as a hundred and other groups are using like ccan as a shared platform um and then we can collaborate and federate to each other that just opens huge worlds of possibility um and to see that advance at its speed is, has been quite exciting the other part is you know the original models, I think, around open data, uh, primarily, I think, that were showcased were all about like app creation. So we release a data set and you can enhance, you know, uh, public service delivery or awareness through creation of, you know, transportation apps or those types of things. And those are still popular and very, very important. But uh, along the civics piece, like Jackie was saying, is like one, we've recognized, you know, that we need a strong understanding of like how government works. But we've also seen there's a ton of activity now in that space. And the like pillars of open government that open data helps support. Really, we see that that activism, that like expectation that we would release data to monitor, you know, the performance of a city program or accountability about how a program is running. Like I think of things like um, you know, COVID data or like uh, our use of the shelter system or opioid uh, overdoses, like those types of things that are like key civic issues within. You know, our, our governments, our cities, our regions, um, there's more expectation from um, the public so that we release that stuff. And, and, and internally, there's been more proactive disclosure on those pieces or, you know, less having to give an open data 101 to explain the importance of it and more of like those groups moving toward it. Um, so, yeah, that's why I settled on that number. What was the number again? Seven. Seven. Okay, so we have a six and a seven. And Derek, where are you at? Yeah, this is this is a hard question. So I came up with two numbers, uh, an eight and a three, and then you just average them together, and I think that's like a six point something, somewhere on there. So the the eight, and, and I mean, Denny kind of spoke to this already to a certain extent. Like, open data has become so, in some ways, open data has become so ubiquitous behind the scenes. Uh, you see this with interoperability. Uh, you see this like there's data is being flowing around all over the place and, and and the openness of data is being leveraged a ton but it's kind of moved into the background as opposed to like something that i think go even back a decade it was like everybody's talking about open data open data was this thing now we don't talk about open data as much it's way less and that's why it's a, a three well okay the eight is that it's being used everywhere the three is that one we're not talking about it and two it's who's using it and i i think open data is being leveraged more and more by the private sector than it is by government i think government is kind of fallen on their face a bit with open data, um, at least fallen behind with open data. Um, and I think the there's a, a lost potential uh, of the of open data to be leveraged for for public good. Um, I think that for me, that's that's one of the things that holds it back. And, and one of the, the ways I kind of look at it is almost like the free software versus open source software 
discussion where free software was driven by this value of openness and sharing and there's a whole value system based around it that really drove the free software movement and then there's a split off where a part of the community is like well if we become a bit more uh, strategic and practical with this and we use less loaded language like free software we call it the open source software instead all of a sudden that allowed a whole new subset of the population to engage with it and open source just took off um, but um, the values to a certain extent fell into the background and open source is really nowadays driven as much by practicality as it is by values. And I think open data has fallen into that same kind of challenge where a lot of the driving things that are driving open data these days is less about values and more about practical functionality. Um, and that's sort of how I got to a six. Okay, awesome. I think that's interesting comment to be sure uh, let's just flick that off um we're actually going to um do a poll i'm just going to release it right now to see where uh listeners stand on this uh they can do the same thing um, um from a scale of one to ten and um, while you're doing that i'm going to follow up a question um to you all which is if you were king or queen of the world what would be the first thing you'd do as it relates to open data i'm sure you'd have other things that you would do around other things but with open data, what would you do as king or queen? Uh, anybody jump in on that one? Well, first, I think the trend is to abdicate and then uh, remove your role from the like monarchy of you know the open data piece um, and create maybe like a more de democratic <laughs> way to set it up. But if I had like a specific, I guess like dream wish list piece, it'd be could we create some sort of digital label that something like a nutritional label that could be put on open data products. Um, so you could see where it was sourced from the percentage of open, the percentage of quality, like that's a bunch of like metrics are in it. So like a nutritional label for open data products or any products in general that consume open data. Mm, like that. Um, actually there's a group of us who are, are kind of playing around with that idea right now, Denny. So you, Solid. Should, you should ping me and I can loop me in. Into, uh, yeah um it's just in a new york we used to have like a get data get the data button for anything it was just kind of like a quick kind of go to the feed and i think that was that was always fun to... i think if if i were monarch for a day um after like getting like a life-sized brownie uh which would make me very happy uh i would look at um really forcing i think government needs to be driving this whole conversation on open data in a much bigger way and i would sort of force government to have open data as like a central value that like all the data government collects and produces is open by default unless there's a good reason not to and we talk about that in government but we don't do it and so there's part of that is like open by default but the other one is just the ability for data to flow smoothly between governments is something else that we're just failing at brutally i'm trying to think like, like almost like um mm -hmm. uh Oh, why am I Jeff Bezos? The Jeff Bezos, the mandate he gave to um, Amazon around APIs and building around APIs. He, I think it was like in like the, I'm not sure when it was like 2007 or 2012 or somewhere in there. He had this whole mandate and it completely changed the way that Amazon worked and moved them towards APIs and microservices and it just transformed everything. I would love to have like that statement. Be like, okay, if you don't do this, you're fired, which is basically what he's, well, it is what he said. And it transformed the way that Amazon works. Government doesn't work that way, but I guess if I was a monarch for a day, I could do that. <laughs> Indeed, you um, have the power. I think if I had that superpower, um, I would do something, I would actually empower kind of open data teams to be resourced at the level to actually work with the business units to improve their data capture processes. Like I think there's, like there's when my, I'm just flashing back to so many conversations about like, well, we want to release this data set, X, Y, Z problem. This doesn't reflect the current situation well. This doesn't describe kind of what we actually see is going on here. There's so many different ways that it can be misunderstood or, or, or misinterpreted. And, you know, that can be partly addressed, but I think a lot, the number of um, times that we were able to like as an open data team, just help people get that spreadsheet into SharePoint, not the most awesome set of tools admittedly, but to actually help them like improve the structure of their data and like their underlying data capture processes and to see that improvement cycle. Like I think that would be, um, that would be what I'd love to do is just like be able to look at the data usability, the data kind of availability perspective and just be like, okay, how do we actually help this business team do the best job possible in having the right data to describe what they're working on and to measure what they're working on. And that gets you straight into like 
IT modernization issues, right? Which is like just the <laughs> decades of technical debt that we actually have in, in government when it comes to information technology. So it's an um, interesting term too, technical debt and the, the idea of legacy systems and so on. Yeah, it's a big problem as uh, it certainly was when I was there. And I imagine it continues where, you know, they built things on platforms that no longer are really sustainable, but the cost to change over is uh, difficult to deal with. And at the same time, what do they decide, right? Which platform do they take? And to me, part of the issue there is the future decision making. I mean, they need to decide not just for this year, but what's likely to be robust enough and flexible enough 10, 20 years from now which is, goes back to even open source, right? If you can deal with it that way, I think you're better off rather than being stuck with a company that's proprietary and so on. I like Jackie's point too about like embedded team members that like we see with the move towards, you know, um, digital modernization, a real pickup overall, like in the last 10 years of like the value of UX or service design within like government system programs, whatever it is, transformation, and the real adoption of like that as being a, uh, you know, a critical component around the design of a new program. Uh, imagine like, service design or a UX equivalent, but an open data person seen as the same level of value on those teams. And they're not just open data, but maybe a data specific person. That would be interesting. What I'm going to do, I think, is uh, just we'll end the poll and we'll quickly cover off what the answers were and then we'll move into our second cut. We'll see if he gets involved. We'd already got some questions coming through, but we had, um, see, I'll share the results with everybody. Um, uh, yeah, what do we got here? Looks like number six, where uh, uh, I guess it was Derek and Jackie landed, right? Because uh, Denise was a seven. Uh, we're saying about six, that's 46%, and followed by a, a little bit of a tie between seven and four. Two people voted for the four, and two people voted for seven, and one at three. So that's, yeah, that's playing around. Uh, I mean, in, meaning we didn't sort of get to the eights, nines, or tens, and I don't think that's a surprise, is it? Is anyone? Yeah, we, so we, we agree we've got a, a ways to go, I think, um, before we can get up there. And, and what I'd like to see, actually, is um, an assessment of what is the goal? What is this dream? And how do we know when we get there? Standard question, right? Um, and I'm not sure that everybody's done that. It's like, how will they even know that they got there? Or will they be content at a six? So let's uh, bring in our second cup opportunity here for folks. This is where you can engage with us, and uh, that's questions or comments. And if you'd like to um, open up your camera and so on, that's possible. I do have a question on just where did it go? That we can start off with. This is in the Q&A tab. And the question is, hi, Jackie, Derek, and Dennis, Denis, rather. What post-COVID challenges would you like to see addressed in our good community well-being hackathon, which is coming up on May 8th? So to repeat, what post-COVID challenges would you like to see addressed in the Good Community Hackathon? So post-COVID, do you mean like once the lockdown pieces are over and we can meet up together or like post-COVID, like post-COVID utilization of COVID data? That's a good question. And it was Jonathan Brown who <laughs> submitted that. So much for anonymity. So Jonathan, you may want to clarify. I'm going to assume it's going forward that we're getting out of this thing. So uh, I, I have two thoughts on this. One is uh, a shameless plug for there's um, on the seventh, there's a hack the data gap, making institutions for disabled uh, people visible. Uh, and I'll put it in the chat um, that actually we're working on as CODs in partnership with Good and a couple other groups. Um, that's a great example of how we can use open data during the COVID pandemic to better support communities that are, that are in need. Um, and so that's like more of that, more using open data to help vulnerable communities, empower them and get the resources they need. In this case, it's about getting them resources um, for, uh, you know, for, for vaccines. Uh, so vulnerable populations sort of left off the radar. Uh, and this data will help empower governments and health organizations to be more effective at getting people with disabilities vaccines because uh, they are the most vulnerable. And there's some incredible statistics coming out of the UK in terms of things like 60% uh, of people who've died of COVID ha have a disability of one type or another. So uh, that's a short-term example. Uh, Long-term, it's a bit more uh, broad and vague, but I, I think we have... Uh, 
quite a hill to climb with regards to uh, inequality. Uh, and I think the pandemic has really made that bigger. Uh, and so I'm really interested in how we can use open data to help sort of level the playing field and empower more and more people. Um, that's vague. It wasn't a very direct answer, um, but it's one I think that there's going to be a huge need for. And if we can use open data to help empower people and sort of democratize societies. Um, yeah. yeah, I think um, just enlarge from that a bit, the hackathons themselves, I think, need to... Um... And I'm not even sure if it's the fault of the hackathon per se, but you know, it's it's leveraging what happens in the hackathon through governments and so on. Often the government representatives are there. Maybe they've even um, put a challenge forward and so on. But where does it go? Where does it end up? Some really good ideas get get generated, but they can't be completed. First of all, you can't finish it necessarily on a weekend or whatever, right? And then secondly, to actually finish it, it might require some resourcing of it. And you know, does it continue to be free? Can cities or other governments use it? If it is free, there's all kinds of ramifications around that in terms of procurement. And I don't think that's really been resolved yet. So we continue to have lots and lots and lots of hackathons. But where does all that good stuff really go, right? And even even tracking it so that um, you're not necessarily reproducing it at another hackathon, right? Um, so those are issues that I see uh, with hackathons that, that need to be resolved somehow, some way, so that you're really getting the true value out of it. Jonathan actually had a follow-up comment um, referencing um, Terranet, uh, hoping that um, Ontario actually doesn't renew that. That said, how do you, how do businesses create new opportunities without enclosing open data through IP fences? How can we stop that? There's a lot to unpack in, yeah. in that question, too. I mean, I think it also, maybe not Jonathan's attention with the question, but... Um, <laughs> is you know looking at our our approach to third-party data sharing agreements so we build a lot of processes in place in order to like perform services like with um you know short-term rental companies or private transportation carriers or other organizations let's say like terranet where we um have a partnership around information um and looking at you know what are the applicable like derivatives of the data that can be shared and identifying, I guess, the gaps in a product that could be delivered or the services that could be rendered for it and showcasing the benefit. I mean, I think we've like, not just on the, on the private data side, but we've been trying to figure out an approach around community source data. Um, so for instance, you know, the, the city will release information around it. it's like tree canopy or the inventory of trees that exist in the city. But I've met with residents groups that like, Hey, no, you know what? Our neighborhood association has been monitoring the trees in our neighborhood and look at the level of detail of the data that we have. Can you put that on your open data portal as an amendment to the data set? And I was like, Whoa, that's a great idea. I mean, Jackie probably has a lot to talk about on something like that. Um, but yeah, like that, those ideas of community source or like other than production of this uh, of the city um, data sets and how do we approach those? I know Jackie, you have to um, take and end your break at this point pretty soon, like 1245, I think. So I want to just give you a chance to have a, a few last words before you have to sign off. Um, yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> let's talk about trees. <laughs> Um, but I think it's it's actually really interesting because I think the, you know, tree data in particular um, around the world, actually, like, you know, I led a big project in New York City about it. But um, I think it really shows that it's really around um, the, the data collaboration surfaces around the issue. Like, like, what is the issue that community groups care about? What is the change that they're trying to see? What is the kind of like government management objective around this sort of resource? And I think the potential of data collaboration is really just kind of like for these two sides to start talking to each other, right? Like in a consistent structured way and sharing information back and forth. Um, in New York City, we, we ultimately solve this eventually by just making sure that there was actually um it was it came down to a data model question right like what's the unique identifier that links the community data set with the public <laughs> with the kind of publicly maintained data set what are the ways that that becomes available and surfaceable um i do think like the idea of like a merged data set I, I like channeling the general counsel now being like well you can't have members of the public you know actually edits official city records but I think that's where <laughs> you can have 
you know, like a federated model. And again, like down to the idea of like linking a community data set with like a government data set so that you can actually have that like rec like explicit recognition that there are multiple actors managing the shared community resource that's like part of a city. Um, I think that is that that's like an exciting conversation. Um, that I'm always about having, but I think that's about like, you know, there was an open data problem. And actually in New York City, the story there is that there were a couple of civic technologists that was like, your open data is terrible <laughs> for street trees. This was true. It was like geocoded by address. So the trees didn't actually like reflect the spatial configuration of trees on the street. And they took it upon themselves to actually develop a tool, a better mapping tool to get that better spatial quality data. And we were able to, over at least a few years though, took to like actually bring that mapping tool in, um, into the way we generated data um, and uh, created an asset map. And then that data set became a shared resource around which these different actors could collaborate. So I think that is, um, so that was just, uh, and that's where also my, kind of like soapbox thumping about like, you know, what is the feedback loop between data use and the actual systems that maintain and update the data kind of come in. So anyway, sorry, it's, I can rabbit hole on that, that one for a long time. <laughs> right. Well, it's clear we can so. carry the conversation on a little bit. It is actually for most people time to get back to their uh, their their day job, their regular work. But um, I'd like to continue a little bit. I know, Jackie, you have to go, right? Um, but I want to continue yeah. maybe just Thanks. a little bit longer. Uh, thanks, Thanks, Jackie, so for coming. Yeah, I'll and, see you. Uh, we'll have you back to the cafe again for sure. Hope you enjoy the coffee. Okay, <laughs> okay. bye. Um, yeah, just before we wrap, um, I, I think there's a few other things we can talk about. Um, in particular, I think uh, the idea of knowing how well used your data is, right? This has been an issue that often comes up. Can you can you give us some kind of data on the data? And some people would interpret, let's say one person going to the data set, downloading it as failure, whereas other people might look at, well, it depends what they did with it, right? Maybe they created something that didn't exist before that was really useful. So what is your take on that? What What is the magic number? What demonstrates success of a particular data set or data catalog? Yeah, I mean, um, as you're talking about like outcome, like how it, it's activated is is really, you know, should that be the, the real measure of the usefulness of an open data set and its success? I'd like to say yes, very difficult sometimes to be able to like quantify that or measure it. I mean, quantification on utilization of an open data set is difficult on its own. So uh, this is something we've not struggle. Yeah, I'm going to say struggle. <laughs> it's, it's a challenging one. It's like you can, you know, monitor how many times the file was downloaded or the page was viewed. And that gives you somewhat of an idea. But we're finding a lot more utilization through, you know, an API. So if it's inside the database ability to pull the data out directly, and that's been traditionally harder for us to monitor. What was funny was when, whenever, or interesting, it was when we were doing the consultation for the Toronto's Open Data Master Plan, we met up with members of the business community um, and startups to like talk about the idea of like, would you passively register for an open data set? You know, uh, say what you're using it for and what the outcomes of your project were. And the uptake was actually way higher than I thought. I thought as soon as you put a barrier like registration, um, people wouldn't, but if it was passive, um, there would be interest in that. And I think that might be an area that we still throw down because being able to tell a narrative around the story of how a data set is activated and utilized to do something gives two benefits. One, it allows us to build upon it as a program and talk about success stories, but also to get the, the full story of what happened and then what were the limitations and how do you want your initiative to grow after or your analysis. We need that information too to improve the data. Yeah, good point. Derek? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's so hard to measure success. <laughs> and it, it's challenging, too, because success could be, like, down the road. Like, it, it's not necessarily time-stamped. Um, but I think that the starting point is just getting better at understanding when open data is being used and how it's being used and, and capturing and, and selling, telling those stories. And, and the challenge is a lot of that's hidden. Uh, one of the projects that I'm currently working on um, 
is to see it's it's an experiment. We have no idea if this is going to work, but we're going to try it anyways. And the idea is to see if we can create like, a, like an open data passport uh, using verifiable credentials that allows uh, people to track the history of an open data set in terms of like, okay, who created it and what context has the data set been edited or something like that. But also uh, potentially keeping track of who's using the data set and, and, and through that being able to better track how the data sets are being used. So that might be an interesting, we're going to see if that will be a way of helping capture because from a government perspective, I think oftentimes data is released as an open data set and then it's into the wild and you know, we, we, there's no, the, the feedback loops aren't clear around, you know, is that data set being used? How's it being used? Stuff like that. Um, it just kind of disappears into the wild. So uh, I think being able to better track that and then through tracking that we can sort of tell the stories of, of how it's being used. I think it's interesting too, even in terms of web and web pages, right? Someone creates a website and, you know, the expectation is you build it, they're going to come, right? They're going to flock there. And often it's, you know, one or two people and it's usually yourself and somebody else, right? Who's, who you know has gone there. So it takes time often to grow an awareness, even that the data set exists. So I believe we're still looking at a somewhat limited audience who uses like a data catalog. Um, this is, this is where, I mean, I've been really thinking a lot about sort of the free software versus open source software stuff before. Uh, Cause with regards to open data, for me, it's always been about values around like, you know, living in a more open society and a more open society has potentially be more democratic. Um, and hopefully through being more democratic, better for everybody. Um, but there's also sort of a, a practicality sort of lens to this is where the, the open source software, and the reason why open source software has been way more successful than sort of the free software movement is that open source software is incredibly practical. It solves problems. And I think where open data has struggled is being, uh, at least I think a lot of those of us who are pushing open data, including myself, really focus on the value of openness. And and I think it's when when like there's a problem and open data helps solve a problem and that makes things better for people. So the the hackathon that I mentioned happening on Sunday is a really good example where you know there's a problem. People with disabilities who are in homes, we don't know where any of those people are. There's no way, we, all we do know is that they're the most vulnerable when it comes to COVID or one of the most vulnerable when it comes to COVID. We need to find a way to figure out where they are so we can make sure they get vaccines so that we can protect them. That's a very specific problem. Open data helps get us there, but it's a means to an end, which is a very different way of approaching it. And um, I don't know, I'm intrigued by that. I, I have mixed feelings because in the process of doing that, you lose the value base of like, this is about openness. It's like, no, 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 this is about practicality but I don't want to lose the openness value of it at the same time. Yeah, that's uh, challenging, isn't it? Um, well said, well said, I think. Well, gentlemen, I think we're going to do the wrap up. There's a couple of things I wanted to do um, uh, just to let you know what's coming up um, for us. Uh, Cause uh, Cods is involved in an event actually just after what I'm going to talk about here, we're doing a, um, a uh, good Palooza event on Saturday, which is to celebrate international open data day. And uh, that's going to be from 11 to 1230. And at one o'clock, CODS has got something in terms of advocacy, I think they're talking about. And we are going to have Paul Connor talking to us and our good Palooza about that event. So if people are interested, hopefully you'll come and start to our event. You have a comment? Well, I, I mean, I can speak a wee tiny bit to yeah, that, sure. Go ahead. Uh, to give some context. Uh, so one of the things that we're looking at for Canadian Open Data Society is that there's been a lot of interest in creating an advocacy committee for open data in Canada. And the idea of the advocacy committee, well, in many ways, that's that's the whole point of like the, the get together is to figure out what do we want this advocacy committee to do. Uh, and so if you have thoughts on, you know, how could we advocate for more open data in Canada? What does that look like? How do we want to do that? Uh, the advocacy committee is a very practical, like working group level space where you can come and help sort of direct the Canadian Open Data Society in terms of what our advocacy committee should do and become a part of it and help drive that work to advocate for open data in Canada. So that's what that's about. Great. A good practical example, too, of something to do on an open data day, right? It's mission forward and so on. So information about that is on the website, Canadian Open Data Society. Is I believe it? so. Yeah, okay. You can check. I'll, I'll carry on and you can come in and confirm that. What we're planning to do actually is uh, premiere good radio. We've got a playlist already that two songs relate specifically to open data. Uh, there really isn't a lot of open data songs per se out there, but the playlist kind of uh, dovetails with what open data is used for. So that's going to be kind of interesting. We'll, we'll bring up uh, at least mentions of those songs. I'm a little concerned about the copyright factor if we bring on, you know, um, a, a band that's well known, shall we say. So at least we'll reference them. Um, we're going to be playing videos from the uh, GoodTube channel. 
And um, we'll also be talking to some guests again who will come in and talk about some of their projects that they're doing. And it really is a chance to more or less have a, a little bit of a party around it as opposed to doing a hackathon or, or being involved in something um, like the advocacy meeting. Uh, so we're not looking to come out with anything but uh, happiness, I think, uh, saying, you know, that open data day is a good thing and uh, let's have a bit of a party around it. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, do you have any last words, Derek? I see you're raising your hands. Well, so go ahead. I, I mean, I can just so the, I, I put a link in the chat, uh, but it says details coming soon. So probably a better way to do with this is just email me. So here's my email chat, okay. and I will make sure if you are interested, I will make sure you get the information as it comes up, or you can just keep an eye on the website as new data comes forward. But yeah, if you're interested in being part of the advocacy committee discussion uh, for Canadian Open Data Society. Uh, help giving us direction how we should advocate for open data in Canada, please send me an email um, and I will, yeah, I will you in. Make sure you have the information. Okay. I'm just looking to how you save chat for folks just to give them an alert. They can save it. And I can see it on my master thing. I've got a user view of audience view here and I don't see a save tab. There should be, if you go to the chat function uh, beside where you type, it says two and then whatever there, there's yeah. like a little three dot, dot, dots. Yeah, I've right. clicked on that. And, and I just get merge to meeting yeah. window. I see merge to meeting window, but there's also a save chat option on mine. And okay, I'm it could be because this particular laptop is using um, older software. So that would be one way. I'm going to save it here from our master side, and, and I can always put it up uh, when we post it um, as well. Uh, so just in case you don't remember that, and we might as well uh, give the actual mail. It's alton.derek, D-E-R-E-K, at gmail.com. That's correct. For that information. And Denis, do you have anything you might want to add just as we wrap her up? Yeah, I just wanted to do a shout out and a thanks to um, all the other yous or me's, you know, in this space. I mean, the level of collaboration in the last year, especially during these like trying circumstances, has been like outstanding. Um, and I also wanted to say to like any other region like smaller than the city of Toronto, you know, that doesn't have, let's say, the, the resources and, and infrastructure and that they're trying to move forward in the space, like reach out. There's a lot of like partners in other regions and municipalities, and we're here to like help promote and push each other forward. So that um, that concept of collaborative environment or in the open data sphere ha is still going strong. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking part in this. And um, no doubt it's to be continued and hopefully we'll see you in uh, other platforms, if not uh, the Good Cafe, perhaps at our conference and uh, various other things that we're planning to do with Good. I'd like to thank our audience participants. Uh, most of you hung in. Uh, we st I can see they're dropping off right now, so that's good. But thank you, folks, for sticking around. This will be up on our GoodTube channel uh, shortly, as soon as I can get to a quick edit on it. And uh, our next webinar is in April, and uh, we're just finalizing the details on that. So I'm just going to go into a quick credit roll after I say my final piece, which is basically, uh, until we meet again, be good to each other, folks, and we'll see you again soon. We meet up virtually, our beverages are free, for open data coffee. Y'all come back now, you hear? That's a wrap. So long, everybody.